I was always good at teaching myself things. If I wasn't going to let the world teach me, I was going to learn through my own experiences. Believe me, this was painful because many of those experiences were not such great experiences. I was hungry. I was lonely. I probably was in danger a lot of the time. Uh, the cities were not safe. The city streets were not safe. Um, but I had to do it through my own experience. And that power, so when you're 15, you don't have any power. Right? That, I remember so clearly saying, I'm so frustrated because I want to do all these things, but I have no mechanism to do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to travel around the world. I don't know how to run my life or learn these things. But what my power is, is collecting knowledge. And somehow I knew early on that knowledge was like money in the bank, that if you could collect experiences, that if you could learn teach yourself calculus, that if you could read a history book, all of which I love to do, if you could teach yourself music, then somehow I had the knowledge or the conviction that that would add up. So I got to go to college. I got into Princeton, and not on my grades, but probably for some of the other crazy things that I did in arts and music and Probably didn't hurt that my father was a Princeton grad with his PhD in physics and knew some of the engineering faculty there. And it also probably didn't hurt that I was the only woman ever to apply in mechanical engineering in the 70s. Actually, I think there were two or three before me, but it was just so unheard of. And that was good advice that my father gave me, that if I just applied in engineering, they would look at me, and when they looked at me, they would find me interesting and capable, if not having proven my, that through grades. And I got into Princeton, and that's what I studied, engineering. Well, I still believe that collecting experiences is what life is all about. And I had no intention whatsoever of being a mechanical engineer. I took that as an opportunity to get into a good school. Then I found out it had very few requirements at Princeton. You could get a degree in mechanical engineering without knowing a lot of engineering because Princeton undergrads did not become practicing mechanical engineers. They went on to finance or law school. And so they, they didn't really feel they needed to teach us piping diagrams or something like that. So I took that opportunity to study languages and economics and literature and Russian and, and have just a, a wonderful experience learning as many things as I could. And then all of a sudden I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. And that was after living in Italy. I lived in Italy and I worked as a mechanical engineer, hated that, absolutely hated that. And I worked in Spain and Brazil. And I said, well, I could be a CEO of a company. I could be a diplomat. I had no idea what these jobs actually entailed. But I wasn't sure what to do. And I found out that I really cared about what was happening in society at the time. This was now the end of the 70s. And we had so much disruption particularly in energy. So you remember the oil crises and cars going all around the block waiting to get gassed. We had these huge disruptions and you could tell that our way of life and the future was in danger if we didn't learn how to live sustainably. So I took it on myself to help implement President Carter's plan of 20% renewable energy by the year 2000. And I went to the Solar Energy Research Institute in Golden, Colorado, which was a brand new national laboratory. Because I wanted, by then, I really wanted to do something that would benefit society and the planet. I didn't want to just tear things down anymore. I had grown up to the point where just questioning was no longer satisfying. 
When you're young, you can question, but you don't know how to solve the problem. At Princeton, I was given some tools that I could use to actually attack a problem and maybe even offer a solution. And I thought that implementing renewable energy and getting us out from under the thumb of you know, the Arab, the Middle East, and our, our addiction, the United States addiction to gasoline and to oil would maybe offer a good alternative. Reagan was elected a year after I got to the Solar Energy Research Institute. The solar collectors you know, came off the White House, the cars grew from this to this, and it was pretty clear to this young engineer that solar energy future was going to be a rocky road. And that was true for all renewable energy. So I said, well, let's go learn something new. And I applied to graduate school at Berkeley. Berkeley sounded like a good place to be. I'd never been to California. This was 1980 when I applied, and, or 1981, and I showed up. I was admitted to graduate school in chemical engineering because I thought still maybe I could do something technological for replacing oil. And I showed up at Berkeley at the beginning of the DNA revolution. My timing was fantastic. And I just got so excited about the technological implications of being able to manipulate the code of life for the first time. That's what was happening. Well, this is a, an old idea. Uh, cars were run on wood. In the old days, they could burn wood, gas, gasify wood. Cars were run on ethanol. I mean, oil is a new phenomenon. That didn't become widely available until the 30s and 40s. So the original fuels were, a lot of them were bio-based. Uh, we lost that when it became so easy to pump oil out of the ground. But we all know that biology stores solar energy in all sorts of forms, and one of those forms is plants. So these ideas had been around for a long time that you could convert plants into fuels. I wanted to do that when I went to graduate school in the 1980s, but we were not ready for that then. And that's when I got caught up in this whole new revolution that we could manipulate the code of life, that we could cut and paste DNA. These brand new companies, Genentech, Amgen, they were just being formed out of this revolution in the technology. Now they're mega companies today, but this was a whole nascent set of ideas. And here I was, a young graduate student learning biochemistry and learning chemistry for the first time from the people who, who started this revolution. So I looked at the biological world and said, that's what I want to engineer. Not nuclear power plants, not rocket ships, not airplanes. I thought maybe it would be fun to work on spaceships. I said, no, look at the biological world. Here is the most beautiful, intricate, functional, capable set of engineering things that have ever been devised. And it was all devised by the biological world, by evolution not by human beings, not by human engineers. And I said, I want to engineer that. I want to go in and modify DNA to solve human problems, to solve the same problems that I saw in my previous career. There were lots of problems to solve, but I didn't have the tools. And I said, now I'm going to take these brand new tools and apply them to looking at some of these things. Why not learn from the best? We have four billion years of work that went into the chemistry of the biological world. So just, just looking at it from the chemistry point of view, you know, our whole chemicals industry, our whole lifestyle is predicated on the need to take abundant starting materials and turn them into our clothing and our packaging and our housing. Basically, everything that supports our life is done through chemistry. And we do a terrible job at it. Human beings 
do chemistry very inefficiently, and we've managed to pollute the planet at the same time that we provide these products for us. And I said, surely we can do better than that and just look at the biological world for examples of how you can take abundant renewable starting materials, not oil, sunlight, and carbon dioxide, cheap things from the planet and turn those into the products we need in our daily lives. And the way nature does that is with these protein catalysts called enzymes. They convert one form of matter into another and into all of life. And these are the most beautiful, intricate, efficient, selective, non-polluting machines that you can imagine. No human being can master that chemistry. No human being can mimic that chemistry. Only biology can do that. So I said, I'm going to become an engineer of biology and convince the biological world to take these same abundant starting materials and make the things that I need. So it's easy to say, I want to be an engineer of the biological world, but no one had any clue how to do it. These are complicated things that we know very little about. How does DNA encode a human being? How does DNA encode even a single protein molecule? These are answers that we don't have yet, and we won't in my scientific lifetime. But there's a process by which all of that was invented, and that process is called evolution. No human being designed any of this. It came out through a simple algorithm of mutation and natural selection. So I didn't know how to design new DNA, but I was aware of this engineering process, and I said, okay, if I don't know how to design, why not breed molecules? Why not breed them like you breed cats and dogs? We don't know how this DNA encodes a hairless cat, but you don't have to know. You can breed it by choosing the parents and deciding who goes with whom and which progeny from the next generation go on to, to reproduce. You can do the same thing with molecules in the test tube. So I rejected the way that the engineering world was approaching this problem. Biochemist would say, we have to get the structure, you have to understand everything, then you can engineer it. I said, no, I'll be, I'll be old and dead before that happens. Why not use the process that nature uses and breed these new molecules in the test tube, make mutations in the DNA, recombine DNA from 33 different sources. You, know, you don't have to have two parents in the test tube. And then let the system search through those new products and see which ones are starting to acquire the traits that, that I'm interested in. And that way we would completely circumvent this complete ignorance of how DNA encodes function. We would just evolve it. And of course, people thought that was a nutty idea. And it wasn't scientific. Uh, I was crazy in those days. I had three little kids, a uh, husband who was also eager to do his science, and um, I had no patience for pushback. <laughs> I had no patience for people who wanted to you know, give me advice or tell me it wasn't going to work. Uh, first of all, I knew it would work. And second, I was never good at taking advice anyway. So people would tell me that, oh, gentlemen don't do random mutagenesis. You make mutations at random and because you're supposed to sit with your big brain and figure things out, or that's not science. I'm there, hmm. Well, I'm not a gentleman and I'm an engineer, so maybe that's okay. <laughs> so I just was able to ignore the naysayers. Not to say it didn't hurt my feelings. I listened to the criticism. I took the pieces that were useful to me, and I completely just ignored the rest. and just said, you don't know. You don't understand. Because I'd seen lots of people who thought they knew everything, and they lied to us. So I was able to, 
I guess just by the force of my very stubborn character, just say, no, I know this is going to work. And I knew it was going to work right away because it worked right away. And it took me 20 years to convince the rest of the world, or it probably took two years to convince some people and then 20 years to convince others. And maybe others are not even convinced today. But this method really, really worked when no other approach did. As a mother, I had children who looked to me when the most terrifying things were happening, when their father died. I, you could fall apart, but if you fall apart, what happens to everybody else? Um, I guess I just never felt sorry for myself. Maybe when I was 15, I had a little bout with feeling sorry for myself. But then once I got control over some parts of my life, I realized, okay, what I have control over is how I respond to challenges. I can't control what other people do, but I can control how I respond. And really, my life is not so bad. So with that combination of attitude that I'm really very lucky, and I have been very lucky, uh, that helps deal with the parts that are not so lucky. None of us is entitled to a challenge-free life. And young people come to me and ask for advice on you know, how to deal with you know, what they see as their challenges and, and, and try to avoid it. You can't avoid challenges. You can only overcome them. Right? It, you don't have control. Loved ones will die. You will not get the job that you really want. You will be laid off. Someone's going to criticize you. It's going to happen. How you respond to it really dictates whether you will be happy or not. Well, um, I was sound asleep in a Dallas hotel room uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, having just arrived to Dallas to give a talk at, at a school nearby. Uh, the telephone rang, and of course, I thought it was one of my sons with some sort of disaster. I've had enough of those that I keep my telephone on at night. And it was this sweet voice from Stockholm saying that, uh, could I hold on for the Nobel Prize Committee? And the Secretary General got on and told me I had been given, I was going to be awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And I just hit the ceiling and said, holy, <laughs> you know, I was very excited. I was um, stunned. And so I had to put the telephone down. They, they call you back in half an hour for a press conference, and they tell you you can't call anybody. So I couldn't call home. I couldn't do anything. And so I said, coffee, shower, coffee, shower. <laughs> <laughs> I took the shower first because I knew it was going to be a very long day, and then I got a cup of coffee, had the press conference, and then I tried to call home. I tried to call my older son who works at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and of course he doesn't pick up the phone. And I tried to call home where my younger son was, and of course he doesn't pick up the phone. So I'm walking around the hotel room, you know, just I couldn't reach anybody, and I was very excited. And in the uh, Nobel Prize Committee, they said, oh, you sound so relaxed. And I'm a good faker, I guess. <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness, I'm climbing the walls trying to pretend to sound relaxed. But I was really very excited. I didn't imagine the future. That's, I keep, people ask me that question. Um, I just imagined the near future, right? How am I going to get through today and tomorrow, um, maybe next year? But I never saw myself as winning a Nobel Prize. That was way out there. <laughs> I, I think it's important to realize, though, that most scientists, not all, we don't do science for prizes, right? We don't get paid that much <laughs> to, to work for the rare really rare thing that a Nobel Prize would do. We start off because we love it every day. 
And that's why I became a scientist finally after going, after trying many other careers. And since I became an engineer and there's no Nobel Prize for engineering, I, it wasn't on my radar. Although I am at Caltech where 10% of the faculty has Nobel Prizes. It's not a rare event around here. I know people who have Nobel Prizes, but it wasn't really on my radar. And the reason is that, that I went into science to become a researcher, and I did it at age 30, uh, because I finally found something that I enjoy to do every day. We don't work for prizes, most people. Most scientists work for the joy of inventing and discovering that we do every day. And I, that's, that's why I feel so lucky that I have this opportunity to work with young people, to invent things, to do things that I hope will help the planet. And if a prize comes along, that's nice too, but that's just icing on the cake. There was civil unrest, political unrest, and all the young people uh, were questioning everything. I've been thinking about this quite a bit, uh, what made me just reject everything that was around me, and that's just the way it was. Remember, don't trust anybody over 25. And uh, also, it was very poor. You think about Pittsburgh, here was a thriving steel city that all of a sudden, starting in the 60s and 70s, just decayed. The steel industry was closing down. The city had the remnants of all the pollution over the years. It was black, it was gritty. People didn't have jobs. So there was a lot to fight against uh, that someone, a young person like I was, was looking around trying to find her, her place. It was a big time. We were protesting the Vietnam War. There were civil rights protests all over. These inner cities, I lived in the inner city in Pittsburgh and in Baltimore, they were burning. Uh, I was bused to the high school with kids from neighborhoods I'd never even set foot in and I didn't realize what they went through. So there was just huge changes that, that were going on. Well, they probably felt they didn't have enough influence because I was doing my best to pretend to ignore what they wanted me to do. Uh, my father was a nuclear physicist. He worked for Westinghouse. and He invented some of the first commercial pressurized nuclear reactors that went into the nascent nuclear industry that came out of, out of the nuclear navy. And this was a, a, an exciting time in the 50s because we were talking about energy too cheap to meter. And then of course, reality stepped in and we had nuclear accidents like Three Mile Island in the 70s. And we realized we were playing with fire here. So my father was, uh, he loved science. He loved mathematics. I'm sure he would have really wanted to be a professor if he didn't have five children. <laughs> but he, he encouraged all of us uh, to look at science as a career. My father, he, he encouraged me to do what I wanted to do, uh, and I was good at science. My mother wanted me to do what she liked to do, which was volunteer work. She was a member of the Junior League. She um, loved curls and dresses and all the things that I couldn't stand. Uh, so we were always at loggerheads over what, how I would look and what I would wear and what I would do with my time. As I mentioned, these, these things that were going on in society made me or helped me question the values of the previous generation. Um, we, we felt we were being lied to. And we were. Uh, not everything, but it, there was enough discrepancy between what we saw in the newspapers or what we saw in society and what we felt was really happening. And Vietnam was such a big part of that. And I should mention, my grandfather was a three-star general in the Army. And General William Howard Arnold, my father's father, 
He was in World War II, and he retired in the 1950s after leading the Fifth Army in Europe. Uh, and there, was a, there were many members of my family who were career army officers. My other grandfather was a colonel in the army. So there was this strict discipline and this idea that you didn't question authority, which of course made me question authority even more. We were also a fairly strict Catholic family, and that was very hard for me to swallow. <laughs> so I, I spent a lot of time early on, uh, and, and I don't know why, but I just felt I had to battle everything. Uh, I spent a lot of energy. And at some point, my parents just said, you know, we can't do this. We can't have you going out at night, doing what you want to do, hitchhiking to Washington to protest the war. You're a bad influence on your brothers. So I said, okay, I'll move out at 15. And uh, I was very self-sufficient. I could easily go get a job. They didn't pay very much, but I could work in a pizza parlor. Or, or I had many jobs over the years, from pizza parlor to cocktail waitress, taxi driver. I worked in the famous jazz club of Pittsburgh, Walt Harper's Attic. attic. And they um, never asked for ID or age or anything like that. So when I was 17, I would lie about my age and say I was 22. They, they didn't care as long as I could carry a drink and add two and two. They were happy to have me. So I, I found it easy to support myself at a very low level in these gritty, cheap apartments that you would find. I was in high school uh, sometimes. I, uh, I have, my parents gave me a stack of truancy letters a few years back that they had collected over the years where I was expelled from school. They still do this today. I was expelled from school because I didn't show up for class. And they would say, please keep Francis away from school for the next three days. And I had many of those. So I say by the time I, and I did graduate from high school, some miracle happened. I think my parents marched in and <laughs> said, you will graduate her. But uh, by some miracle, I graduated without really spending a lot of time in school. No, there weren't any. <laughs> it's in engineering, I was, I think, one of the very first chemical engineering professors. I, I had no female professors. It was not either in mechanical engineering or chem, not a single one. Uh, and then in chemistry, there's excellent ones. But by then, I was, you know, 30 years old, and I made my own way. My respect for nature is part of it. The other part is the willingness to say, I don't know how to do it. Because I could come in and criticize, right? It, it, a lot of basic scientists took it as a criticism of their level of understanding. I would say, you don't understand it well enough to design it. And, and they took that as a criticism, but I was just stating what, as an engineer, was obvious why I wouldn't use their methods. So I was able to come into this field, take a look at it. I wasn't embedded in any one technology. I wasn't trained by biochemists. And I was able to, to, to look at the thing and say, whoa, that's never going to work. And not you know, criticize anybody other than the people who were doing that. And so I could then step back and say, well, if that's not going to work, Let's do something that will. Well, there was an aha moment in the sense that it wasn't obvious how to do this. I had to think about it quite a bit. But it became obvious to me when I did think. Right, you think about how do you create something that's never before existed in the biological world and do it on a time scale, using evolution on a time scale of days or weeks, not eons, not millions of years, with one graduate student and not an army of graduate students? How do you do it so fast that you actually can get something done? And that's what took thought. 
And that's why my methods work, because I had this engineering, do the simplest possible thing, and the most efficient way to go about it, and somehow I was able to lay that out and implement it and be the first ever to do that. And that's why I got the Nobel Prize. It probably would have been done later by somebody else, but I actually did it first. And it worked. The way that I laid it out worked, and that's the method, that's the general approach that people have taken since to do similar things. When I saw our first experiments, when I saw that, first of all, you could convince a protein to adapt, right? You could train this protein to do something completely non-natural, something nature had never asked it to do before, and do it quickly on the time scale of weeks or months. That was the first thing that I, I said, well, it works. And then when I reverse engineered it, so we said, how did this happen? What changes in the DNA sequence gave rise to these properties? Are they obvious? So we sequenced the protein and figured out what mutations in its gene led to these properties. And that's when I said, aha, nobody will catch up with me because they're so subtle. Nobody can even explain these. Right, so for example, it's you are you, I am I, what are the differences between us? And how does our genome explain why you are you and why I am I? Nobody can tell you that. Nobody can tell you that it's this that makes you think the way and love journalism the way that you do, or that it's this that makes me good at mathematics. Um, it's the same with a protein. I could evolve this protein, I could see its new properties, but I couldn't explain why these mutations did that. So that's when I realized that those who would rationally design the same proteins wouldn't be doing it in my lifetime. That was 30 years ago. And they still can't do it. <laughs> there was a lot of desperation in there too. You know, once again, it went, you know, with three little kids and a lot going on at home and you know, many responsibilities and Tenure is a very limited time clock. I wanted to get it going now. And that time clock is fast compared to, say, a time clock in industry. So I needed to move quickly, and I needed this process to move quickly, and it did. Well, microorganisms love to eat sugar. Something like a yeast, for example, for thousands of years, we've used them to convert sugars, like in flour, for example, into carbon dioxide that goes to leavening bread or into alcohol. I mean, making beer is converting sugars into ethanol. What we can do today, partially using the methods that I developed, is convince something like a yeast to eat sugar and convert it into jet fuel, right? That's the whole idea is to use this beautiful platform that biology has created, these, these self-reproducing organisms, just reprogram them a little bit to stop making more yeast, stop making ethanol, and instead make jet fuel. It works well. The practical ramifications are enormous. Uh, this whole idea that we can compose new DNA. So, Today, we can read DNA, you can sequence a whole human genome. We can write DNA, you can synthesize a piece of a gene, a whole gene, a whole genome. You can edit DNA, so you've read about CRISPR and human genome editing and making designer babies. We can do that. But what we can't do is compose it. I cannot compose a new biological catalyst. I don't know how to compose that but I can evolve it. And so that realization is so important for this. So this process of being able to compose empowered lots and lots of people to make new enzymes and other things. And they started making new enzymes all right away. People in industry looked at what I was doing and said, that makes total sense because I'm not gonna wait around for the biochemist to tell me how this works. 
I can just use it. So what they do? They made laundry detergents. You go to your laundry detergent, you see enzymes. Those are all made by directed evolution because those enzymes, if you pull them from nature, they want to be coddled. But if you put them in a laundry machine, <laughs> they usually stop working. So companies had to make them more stable and more robust and ability, able to go over all sorts of temperatures. But apart from that, you can use enzymes to make drugs, you can pharmaceuticals, you can use enzymes to replace toxic chemistry, you can use enzymes in personal care products, we use them to make uh, textiles, baking in bread. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that human beings use enzymes, and almost all of them are optimized by directed evolution now. So we develop basic science processes here at Caltech, but every once in a while, we might even make something useful. And my definition, I'm a good engineer, my definition of useful means someone uses it. It's that simple. It's not useful unless someone uses it. No one's going to use it unless you get it out into people's hands. That's not what we do at Caltech, that's not my job. My job here is to be an educator, to do basic research, to publish papers so that other people can learn from the methods and not make products. That's the job of a company. But some of the bright young people who come here want to take their ideas and put them into place in the world. So over the years, in fact, it's been 30 years now, uh, I've been involved in a number of startup companies that take the germ of an idea or some little piece of an invention and get them out into the marketplace. That to me is tremendously satisfying because it also validates our process for invention. I love Provivi. Uh, this is a company that was formed by one of my PhD students, Pedro Coelho, and another PhD, former PhD student, Peter Meinhold, and they are going to revolutionize crop protection, agriculture. I would dearly love to replace pesticides. We, we are dumping billions of pounds of these toxic agents onto our planet in order to grow the crops that we need to feed a growing population. Resistance to pesticides is marching inexorably up from South America and these, these crop pests that, that destroy crops are becoming resistant to these chemicals. So we put more out. Now, imagine this. You've got pests, insects have to have sex to mate, right? And it's their caterpillars. So you have moths that go and eat corn, it's their caterpillars that eat corn. So if you can interfere with insect sex, you don't have caterpillars, and if you don't have caterpillars, you don't have damage to the crop. So how do insects find each other in a field? They emit little Chanel number no. five plumes, tiny, tiny bits of molecules that go out into the, into the air, and then that brings the male to find the female. So imagine you have a bottle of this Chanel number no. five, and you just spray it <laughs> around the field. You confuse the males, and they fly around and they can't find her. They know she's there, but they can't find her. Then they don't mate, and then you don't have crop damage. Now, the Chanel number no. five is a very specific molecule invented by the insects. We know its chemical structure, and unfortunately, it's really expensive to make if you do it chemically. But we invented ways to use enzymes and biology and chemistry to make these things very inexpensively. So now today, we have 75 people in Santa Monica who are working on implementing this in Indonesia, South America, Mexico, white corn in Mexico, vegetables and corn in South America, rice in Indonesia, so that you would be able to use this organic, non-toxic mode of pest control for agriculture. It's not hard to convince them because they all see pesticide resistance. They see this as a looming wall. We will not be able to feed the planet unless we solve this problem. Uh, the maize crop in Africa has been completely destroyed in some areas 
by this fall armyworm that just comes and eats everything. And there's no way to treat these fields. In South America, it's, uh, it's devastating. So this, I, I think the, the industry is actually very eager for this to work. We've been able to recruit the top people from key companies into this little startup because they see this as a, as a major benefit. Jane Goodall made a video that's on our website saying this is the way we need to go. I'm proud any time that I see a toxic chemical process, something that produces toxic waste or requires precious metals, which have to be mined at terrible environmental degradation costs. I'm, I'm proud when I see that replaced with a clean, efficient biological process that doesn't produce those things. And we have to do that a million times over in order to move away from our addiction to this, to this old-fashioned chemistry that we do. So one of the companies that I founded years ago now, in 2004, remember when oil hit that high price again, $150 a barrel? We've had you know, these crises over the years. When oil hit $150 a barrel, we invented ways to convert renewable plant resources into precursors to aviation fuel. And that company was a big success for a while until the price of oil went down. They're still in business, that's called Jivo. And Jivo is in Colorado and they make aviation fuel. So you can actually buy this fuel, it's flown, it's been used to fly various airlines. But what you can't do is make money. That's really a problem because we are not willing as a society to pay the price of dumping this carbon dioxide, this carbon, into the atmosphere. So we keep pumping oil out of the ground, burning it in our cars and dumping it into the atmosphere, and we're going to do that until we all boil. And I'm hoping that we will learn that we cannot do that. We have to use renewable alternatives, and it can be electricity, now, it could be solar energy, it could be renewable biofuels. It's going to be some mixture of all those, but we have to be willing to pay the cost of our current, uh, our current usage now. I think it's even more fun that we can achieve in a short period of time what never would appear, right? I don't want to recapitulate what would happen naturally. I want to take biology where it would never have gone because I want to put it in service of helping humans live on this planet without destroying everything else. And so I want to use biology to do something in support of that, of that goal. And biology wouldn't do it without a little bit of convincing. <laughs> Biology just does, plays beautiful music. If you look at the code of life, to me, that's like a Beethoven symphony. It's something I could not compose. It's something intricate. It's, it's stunningly beautiful. I can't compose it, but there's this, there's this machine, this evolution algorithm. You just turn the crank, make random changes, and select for this function. And out comes all this wonderful diversity. Out comes all the life that you see around you that has come out of this machine of natural evolution. So I want to make a machine like that for artificial evolution. And that's what we've been able to do. So now I can decide what I want my symphony to do. What, how does it make you feel? How does it give you something that you did not have before? And I can turn the crank and create that. So I'm really interested now in not just how do you optimize something that already exists. Much of directed evolution is you take an enzyme and you just make it more stable, make it a little more active. You tweak it in, in new ways. Um, I want to innovate. I want to create something that people go, oh my goodness, I didn't know you could even do that biologically that has a function, it's, it's almost like creating a new species. 
right? But this is at the level of molecules, so I'm not creating new species. I'm making molecules that do chemistry that people never thought would be possible using biology, make bonds that you never find in the biological world. So we've been working on doing things like linking carbon and silicon together. That's chemistry only invented by human beings. Biology never cared about doing that. I'm not sure she would ever care about it were I not around. But just to see how can you create this, this innovation? How do you use evolution to jump forward into a chemical, a world of chemical possibilities that, that opens up whole new ways of thinking about biological chemistry? See, I, I face skeptics who say, well, you know, biology is really cute. You can make ethanol. Maybe you can make a little bit of jet fuel. But you can't make what I can make. I can make these bonds or these compounds that you never find in the biological world. And I said for a long time, you know, that's true. But why is that? Why can a human do it? Biology can't. Well, nobody ever asked. It turns out biology can do a lot of things better than human beings. So for the last five years, we've been focusing on making chemical bonds or chemical structures that human beings invented that were never known in the biological world and some things that human beings can't even make. So how do you jump out beyond? And we do these things better than the humans can do it. We show that biology learns it like that. Biology can learn really quickly if you use this evolutionary process. The realization that we can do almost all of our chemistry with clean biological systems. That you can't, you can no longer tell me, oh, biology can't do this. Biology can't make these compounds, so don't even bother me with a biological solution. Oh, no, I'll show them. Well, look, we can do it, and we can do it better than you can. <laughs> a cleaner world, that's, that's what I want to see. And I want us to think in a different way about how we do chemistry, how we teach chemistry, how we think about making these things that we use in our daily lives. Think about making it from something other than pumping oil out of the ground. Think about making a completely new product something that has, that can be made biologically and has even better properties than the plastics that we're using today. Think in a new way about how you would affect these transformations that are so important to us. We can't live on electrons. We need stuff, and we need a lot of stuff, and we need to recycle that stuff. So we need to have new ways to think about how to do that. So I'm writing my Nobel lecture right now. When I have a few minutes free, I go and try to thank those scientists. And I realize that uh, I pulled it from many different places. I, I think I'm good at taking the good from when I read something. I can take ideas and, and parse what's valuable and what's not. And I realized I, I took ideas from philosophers like Dan Dennett. I took ideas from evolutionary biologists like John Maynard Smith. I took ideas from people who were trying to implement evolution for things like RNA, so people like Jerry Joyce at Scripps. I took ideas from lots of people who could explain their ideas well. Um, so I've been influenced by many. I've built my ideas on the contributions of many. And of course, that's what evolution does. It mutates and recombines what's already there. Nothing comes out of nothing, right? It all comes on the back of, of what was there. And these are, the, these are some of the things that I found uh, inspirational. Well, first of all, there were no women in my fields when I went in. So I didn't look to women for role models, or I didn't need to. My father was a good role model, and so were many of the wonderful men who supported and nurtured my career. Um, 
So I would say to women, don't leave it for the guys, right? Don't wait for someone else to blaze the trail. Just go and do it. We need you. Science needs all the good brains that it can get. And just go and have fun with it, right? A lot of women worry about doing something good for humanity. This is a great way to do something good for humanity. A lot of women don't like to be criticized. Men don't like to be criticized. Nobody likes to be criticized. But science is all about criticism, right? We peer review each other. We explain why this idea is not good and my idea is better. And we have these debates. And you have to be willing to jump into those debates and, and take the parts that are beneficial. And you know the personal parts, the things that hurt you, and just set it aside and move forward. So in my research group meeting, which we just now finished, you know, we, we criticize each other, but in a supportive way. And you can criticize and be supportive at the same time. And, and, and I have had students in my office in tears after these sessions, but I say, well, you know, was what they said true? And they said, yeah. <laughs> okay, how do you make your, your presentation better? How do, you, how do you learn from this? And they all just get better. They get better. I get so much pleasure out of that, of, of supporting young people, especially at a place like Caltech. We get the smartest, most creative, really young people in the world here. And you can shut off their creativity so easily by just criticizing. Right? If you just say, oh, that's a terrible idea, period, and there's different ways to open that creativity, and one is to let them just do it, right? Everybody's going to make mistakes. Not everything can be perfected before you do it. You just go in and do it, and then to build, uh, what's, to build an environment where you feel safe to take risks. That's really the trick, the safety in going out and failing. Because it's not risky unless a lot of time it fails. Evolution's all about failure. <laughs> you make random changes and you see what happens, and 99.9% .9 of those are failures, but it's the gem that comes out, it's the 0.1% that really leads you forward. So we implement that almost as a process in my research lab. We were okay with having something fail because we can rapidly recognize when it fails and then recognize when something else succeeds. I wish I had met her. I'm sure she was quite the thing. <laughs> I saw her letter when I went to the Nobel Museum where they, I think for her second prize, the committee had asked her actually not to come because she was living with a man who was not her husband. Maybe her husband had died. I don't remember exactly the thing. And she said, she wrote back and she said, I thought that this prize was for my science and not necessarily my living arrangements. <laughs> so she came and collected her prize. It, it, I may be, I'm paraphrasing it, but I think she had quite the backbone. And she had to, to, to do that in that time and to be so good and so focused on doing what she did. It was just remarkable. No doubt about it. Many more. Uh, we're finally reaching the point where... Uh, the best women are coming into the field, uh, and great women who went into the field 30 years ago are doing fabulous science. I really came at a time when we were just getting this big upswing, when women felt that they could get professor positions, that they could compete, that they could have a good life and a good career. Uh, so I think my, what I can see is that there are a lot of great senior women doing great science. So my prediction is that there will be many Nobel laureates, at least in chemistry, and of course in biology as well, in physiology and medicine. 
physics I'm less familiar with, and it may take a few years longer to get caught up there. But look at our undergraduate population at Caltech. This is a premier science and technology school. We're more than half women. What a change. And if that's the case, and those women feel empowered to go forward in their careers, and they decide that being a scientist and an inventor or an engineer is what they want to do, we're going to see good things. We're going to see good things. Well, there's no guarantee of a stress-free life. <laughs> it's how you manage it. And, and I, I, I don't like to give advice to women about how to manage that because I can't say that I've been all that good at it. You know, a lot of my children will probably <laughs> tell you I didn't manage it well. Um, so I, I don't know. Just I hope that they will do what, what they feel is right. So my son, James Bailey, is building the Mars rover. And he has the most wonderful job. He says that he has the job of his dreams, which is the greatest joy that I can feel, is to have my child say he has the job of his dreams. He never went to college. He went into the army after his stepfather passed away. He went, immediately went into the Army, spent six years in Afghanistan and Germany and the deserts of California as a helicopter repairman and a crew chief on medevac. And he came back from the Army. Interesting that he went into the Army. <laughs> this long history in my family. But he came back from the Army and uh, got a job at JPL because they need people to build this Mars rover who are incredibly careful. There's only one. <laughs> you can't mess it up. And he got this job because of his experience and his mechanical, inherent mechanical capability, and he loves it. He's really happy. Well, he, he's very gifted mechanically. He has a whole workshop in the garage. He builds everything from blowing glass to machining various crazy things. He loves to build things, and he's taking classes at the local community college. He, he, uh, he just got back from Africa as a volunteer in animal sanctuaries, and I think he's now ready finally for college. It was my joy and comfort. I took up piano. I always wanted to play the piano, and I started when I was four years old. And I studied piano until I was about 12, at which point I gave up my piano and my violin. I was terrible at violin. And I took up the guitar. Was, I wanted to play Bob Dylan. And I played guitar, and I, I studied classical guitar until I was 35. Uh, and those, that music, that ability to make music and to play the guitar. I took the guitar all over the world with me. And I played Bob Dylan songs all over Italy and Spain. And I made friends. I just used music as a way to connect to people and to comfort me when I was alone and didn't have anybody to talk to. That, that instrument and that music and, uh, that gave me a lot of joy. I, didn't keep up with my finger um, calluses. And uh, so I didn't stay with the guitar, but I took up piano again about 15 years ago. And then I had to stop after all this craziness happened when my kid's father passed away. But maybe, maybe next year I'll take it up again. I am a builder. Um, I see it in my sons. I see it in myself. I love to build things. And if it's molecules, that's called chemistry. If it's machines, it's called machining. But I love to create something that never existed before and that can also serve a purpose. I'm not a composer. I love music, but I can't compose. 
I'm not a poet. I love poetry. I'm not good at composing words. Oh. But I can compose molecules. <laughs>